Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Gossels, the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to the fifth annual Boston Israeli Film Festival and to this post-screening conversation for the Narrow Bridge. I hope you've enjoyed the in-person films and conversations we've presented thus far and that you'll have time to see the two other films in our virtual festival, Concerned Citizen and Matchmaking, streaming through Wednesday, March 29th. The Boston Israeli Film Festival is made possible through the generous support of the Fine Family Foundation, Massachusetts Cultural Council, Combined Jewish Philanthropies, our friends at the Consulate General of Israel to New England, and you, our pass holders and ticket buyers. Thank you for sticking around for a conversation I'm very much looking forward to hearing with filmmaker and trauma psychologist Esther Takach, moderated by Jeremy Burton, CEO of the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Boston. They will be joined by Steve Watson, senior pastor of the Reservoir Church in Cambridge. Welcome Esther, Jeremy, and Steve. Lovely to be here. And Lisa, I really feel honored that you chose to screen the Narrow Bridge at your Boston Israeli Film Festival. It's very special for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Esther. From the moment I saw your film, The Narrow Bridge, I knew that I wanted to program it. You are a Melbourne-based filmmaker who spent years living in Israel. You regularly volunteer in the pediatric ward of Hadassah Hospital in Israel. Your film profiles four remarkable and courageous members of Israeli-Palestinian bereaved families, Bushra Awad and Meital Ofer, and two of its well-known founders, Rami El-Hanan and Bassam Aramin. The Narrow Bridge is profound, deeply humanizing, and an important reminder that people are not their governments. This emphasis on people-to-people -people peacemaking and change-making led me directly to you, Jeremy Burton. Through advocacy, organizing, service, and partnerships, the JCRC defines and advances the values, interests, and priorities of the organized Jewish community of Greater Boston in the public square. Jeremy, prior to joining the JCRC, you were the Senior Vice President of Programs at the Jewish Funds for Justice and Vice President of Programs at the Jewish Funders Network. You also served as a board member of Keshet, working for the full inclusion of LGBT Jews in Jewish life. I know you have a personal and organizational connection to brief families and many of the individuals in Esther's film. We all look forward to hearing more about that and your initiative, Boston Partners for Peace, and the clergy study tours you lead in the region each summer. Which leads, us, which leads us to Steve Watson. Do I need to do something different? Did something strange happen? There was a little bit of a blip sound there. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to jump back in, but I'm going to go back a little. Okay. That was strange. Um, okay. I'm reprising. Um, I know you have a personal and organizational connection to brief families and many of the individuals in Esther's film. We all look forward to learning more about that and your initiative, Boston Partners for Peace, and the clergy study tours you lead in the region each summer which leads us to Steve Watson, who participated in one of these tours. Steve, you've been the senior pastor of Reservoir Church since 2013. Prior to that, you served as the principal of Watertown High School, as a middle and high school English teacher in the Boston Public Schools, and as a campus staff minister with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Among other things, you serve on the board of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, and your first of many higher ed degrees includes a BA in music from Brandeis University. Welcome again, everyone. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Jeremy, so I'll leave it to you to, to lead the conversation. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Lisa. I'm really thrilled that you reached out to me and to JCRC. Uh, to be a part of this program. Uh, that will come up a little more as we get into this conversation. Uh, suffice to say for our audience, I'll just preview this by saying it's a delight and a, probably a surprise to the folks at the Boston Jewish Film Festival to realize uh, how many people in the Boston community personally know uh, Rami and Bassam, two of the lead featured uh, 
uh, individuals in the film, as well as some of the other women in the film, uh, because of the connections and relationship between this community and uh, the parent circle, the bereaved families form. But before right. we get into some of that, uh, I, I'm really thrilled to talk to Esther. Uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I'm really thrilled to talk to Esther um, and maybe we'll just talk a little bit to you, with you about your role as the writer, director, producer and the initiation of the artistic journey that led to the product that we just got to watch. And then we'll bring Reverend Watson in as well as someone who knows several of the people in the film has had the opportunity and experience to engage with them uh, in the last year. So Esther, uh, why don't we just start very simply with how you came to make, how did you come to make this film? Mm. So I'm a child and adult psychologist in my day job. This is actually my first film. <laughs> um, I've been, I'm, I'm also a, a published author. I know that didn't come up in the bio somehow, but um, um, one of my books actually won a National Jewish Book Award, which I came into New York about you know, a while ago for. But um, so I'm a psychologist and a writer and uh, um, my next project kept coming to me in images so I went and studied filmmaking and script writing and I've got a feature film script waiting in the drawer but this is the first film I'm actually made so I've got a very strong connection to Israel I actually did my master's in psychology at the Hebrew University and lived and worked as a psychologist in Jerusalem for eight years and my eldest son was born there we had to come back to Australia for family reasons but I wanted to continue that connection with Israel and have been working as an honorary psychologist in the paediatric department at Hadassah over about the last 12 years, um, a month, a year. I speak fluent Hebrew and that's been an amazing experience. And I've really seen working at the hospital um, firsthand the effects of the ongoing conflict, how fear and anger can grow on both sides. But I've also seen what happens when an Israeli Jewish boy shares a room with a Palestinian Muslim boy, which is a daily occurrence in Hadassah, and how in that shared intimacy of sickness and vulnerability, people get to know each other simply as human beings and relationships can develop in a different way. And it was during my time there that I got to know Rami Bushra Metal and Bassam, and I, I learned how grief, like sickness, levels people and draws them down into life's essentials and creates a bond. And it was during one of my times working at the hospital that a friend asked me to go to the Israeli-Palestinian memorial ceremony, um, which I had heard about but never been to. And uh, I went there. I was very aware that holding that ceremony on Erev Yom Zikaron was controversial. Um, I really understand that how difficult it is for people on the Israeli side to mourn their, their their lost ones together with the other side, I, and and that's true on both sides. Um, but I I really wanted to see what it was like, and when I was there, I was just really emotionally blown away by the ceremony. I found it very powerful. David Grossman, one of my all time favorite authors, was speaking there. Um, here um, bereaved Israelis and Palestinians share their stories um, uh, with this fierce determination that other people are spared this terrible grief and with the determination that the conflict must end. And I thought people need to know about this. People need to know this story, both in Israel and the Palestinian territories. The story is not known enough and people around the world need to know this story. And I really truly see them as a model of... Um, uh, to managing trauma uh, and also a model for conflict resolution that's relevant for Israelis and Palestinians, but relevant across the globe. So that's how I embarked on this journey making this film. Thanks, Esther. And for, and for the sake of our audience, in case you know, I don't want to assume people are familiar with terminology, uh, Yom HaZikaron is Israel's Memorial Day, which falls the day before Israel's Independence Day. And this event happens the night before that, the one that's featured in the film, which is also in the Palestinian society, often referred to as Nakba or Catastrophe Day. And so there are very different narratives in the two communities about that day, its meaning, and how it should be recognized in those two communities. So it's a very powerful thing to have this thing in a public setting in Tel Aviv where people are coming together. 
and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Um, I do want to ask you about like how you you know uh, how you came to engage with these people while making the film, and maybe something I, I frankly shocked to learn that you are a first time filmmaker because this is an incredibly high, high quality production. And maybe what you learned uh, either in the process of making the film or from these people who you feature. Okay. Well, I learned a lot about filmmaking, obviously. <laughs> um, I mean, just, I actually didn't plan to be the writer, director and producer, um, but that's a long story. I won't go into that. Um, I had two amazing editors. I worked with Uri Mizrahi and Rosie Jones, who really showed me the ropes. We worked very closely together and the film looks as beautiful as it does because of their work. Um so it's really been a team effort, great post-production guy and sound guy. Um, so I've learned a lot about filmmaking, um, which is which is great. But I, for, my heart learning really came from the people in the film. I learned from these four people how even after the most devastating loss of your child or your parent, it is possible for people to hear and understand the other, the pain of the other, and what an enormous difference that makes. I saw how terrible pain changes you, but that sometimes after that pain, you can actually develop strengths you didn't have before. So I kind of feel like we've all heard about post-traumatic stress disorder, but these people show us an alternative, a, a roadmap to post-traumatic growth. And I also really learned about grassroots people-to-people -people peace building which I kind of knew about before, but I didn't take that seriously somehow. You know, the few people who go and demonstrate with women in black or go and visit people in Palestinian villages, I wasn't really sure about the impact of that, but my, my I work here showed me that it's really important and that you can't just have top-down approaches to conflict resolutions like was tried in the Oslo Accords and which failed because the culture on the ground wasn't ready for it on both the Israeli and the Palestinian side. You need to have this bottom, bottom up, changing the culture of conflict on the ground work. So I, I think this people to people peacemaking is really important. Well, Esther, I, t I totally agree with you. I think that's a good place to bring Reverend Watson into the conversation. And uh, Reverend Watson, I'm gonna call you Steve, we're friends, um, if that's okay. Uh, before I bring you in, just add a little bit of the context for how Reverend Watson came to be sitting uh, with Rami and Bassam is the work uh, very aligned, Esther, with what you just said. We at JCRC, you know, we do uh, engagement trips for civic leaders to Israel and the Palestinian areas. And over the years, we developed an initiative called Boston Partners for Peace. And it is exactly speaking to what you just said, which is that the people to people work, the bottom up engagement between these two societies uh, is critical to finding a path forward. And so when we go, we want to engage with people who are doing that work to learn from them, to be inspired by them, and to all, frankly learn how we can amplify and support their work. And many of them come here to Boston. Uh, so just before I turn it over to Reverend Watson, you know, one of the other people who's in the film, uh, Robbie Ruby, uh, has actually done a number of events for us here in Boston over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I have not had the privilege to be at that Tel Aviv event um, just because of scheduling and timing being here. But we've been having a program here the last couple of years, shortly before Yom Atzmaud, where we've had the parents circle and she and one of the other women uh, not in the film, have come here and talked about their experience and had a certain dialogue. And so a lot of the people are familiar here. But so we come to Reverend Watson. And Steve, uh, you were with us last summer. Uh, we are partners and friends and collaborators in civic and interfaith space here in Boston. And we had the opportunity to travel last year. And we were sitting in a very charming uh, room at a hotel in Jerusalem, I guess. And uh, these two fellows, Rami and Bassam, came in, and I, I, not, I don't know what you were expecting. Uh, I don't know what you took away from that experience of listening to the two of them tell their story for an hour, and what it was like for you to then be watching this film. 
Yeah. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I prefer you stick with Steve if you're okay with that. I feel like I don't know. <laughs> violate our relationship otherwise, but um, gosh, I want to answer that question, but let me first say, um, Esther, what a privilege to be, uh, to be watching your film and to be included in this conversation and, uh, and Jeremy, a joy to be doing this with you. Um, I, uh, think I'm here because I, uh, cried my way through the visit with Rami and Bassam in that hotel lobby in Jerusalem. And I cried my way through the screening of the film when I first watched it. And um, lest that be interpreted as uh, just sort of a over emotional sensitivity or something. I, um, you know, in my spiritual tradition, sometimes tears are interpreted as not just an emotional response, but a sort of reaction to the presence of the divine or the presence of something holy. And I don't know any other vocabulary to use other than that kind of religious or spiritual vocabulary that in the watching of the film and in the uh, ex original experience of sitting with Rami and Bassam and hearing the stories of what it evoked, I, I just feel like I'm in the presence of, of what is extraordinarily beautiful and extraordinarily holy. Mm -hmm. um, so lots more to say, but I feel like I should start with that. I mean, um, and and maybe I'll I will jump in. Well, I don't feel much sure the conversation will go. I'll just jump in to what about what you said about holy. I mean, I I completely agree with you. I feel, as I said, I feel like they are a model for something transcending. I mean, I really feel they have transcended their pain and uh, transformed it into something positive and constructive, um, creative. But it connects me to uh, Leonard Cohen's words in the film, um, where and which spoke to me so strongly. So I just had to do the work to get permission to use that, where he says that this is about a response to human grief, a radical, unique, and holy, holy, holy response to human suffering. And for me, that is the heart message of the film. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was very struck by that um, that moment in the film and the idea that this being holy work. And I think that resonates very deeply for me personally, um, as I know it does for Steve. And I, I, let's talk about this idea of the holy work of, of holding each other's grief. Uh, and I believe he said that it's not about forgiving and forgetting was how he yeah. introduced that. So so yeah. I, I, want, I really want to like, sit with this with both of you because so many people seem to think that uh if jews and palestinians hear each other's pain and trauma and experience it requires them to forgive or requires them to forget their own narrative history in order to move forward and what's being said here and what's being said by these people is something far more powerful about the way forward and i just like would love to invite you both to reflect on that and i know steve we talked about this idea of forgiveness. Yeah, um, sure. I can, I'll uh, say something then, Jeremy. I think, um, um, right, I mean, I have a keen interest as a, I guess, global citizen, but as like a theologian, a clergy person in these kind of themes that you're evoking around, what is what does repentance mean? What does it mean? Was the Hebrew word shuvo, like the returning, right? Was that entail? What does it not entail? And what does forgiveness mean? Uh, my caveat here, I have nothing to say about the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. Jeremy's heard me say this often, but right, I'm an outsider to that conflict, ethnically, religiously, geographically. And so I feel like it's very much not my place to kind of weigh in on the global political issues being involved here. But in terms of what, I mean, I've been engaging a lot of scholarly and religious work, both from Jews like Rabbi Danya um, Ruttenberg's like, beautiful, like on repentance and repair attacks the past year. Yeah. Um, a work by my friend uh, Matthew Ichihashi Potts, who's the um, kind of uh, lead uh, pastor, I guess, at Harvard University. And, you know, I, I think that both of them address a lot of misunderstandings and abuses of content concepts of repentance and forgiveness. So, I mean, Rabbi Dania is sort of saying that whatever repentance may or may not be required of of um of Israelis or Palestinians with regard to the conflict. This is this is a matter of owning owning whatever harm is being done and making amends, not not necessarily of forgiving or forgetting. And it's it's hard to own or even see harm if we can't see and own grief, right? It just feels like whatever harm anyone needs to own, it, it, it can't ever happen without entering into another's grief. And even this work on forgiveness, which is so central to my faith tradition, uh, 
my friend Matthew Potts just talks about how forgiveness is not a work of forgetting, at least healthy forgiveness, but is always a work of grief. Um, there's no forgiveness without grief because forgiveness, if if we were to enter into it, requires a, a, a acknowledging harm that's been done and kind of making our way with that, making our our peace in a sense with that, and no no movement toward any kind of uh, freedom without serious work of grief. So, Esther, I'm, I'm curious, sort of like how you respond to hearing that, and also knowing that you spent time. Uh, really sitting with these families and sitting in circles where many people were sharing. And I, you know, I was watching some of the circles with the women, how um, that sits with you and what you hear in that about trauma and grief and the way forward. Right. Um, I mean, on a few levels, as a psychologist, I know that having the opportunity to tell your story of trauma is important and having that story of trauma witnessed is is, is very important. And I think that's what happens at the ceremony. So I think what helps the people who are members of Israeli Palestinian bereaved families work through their trauma is belonging to that organization um, and, and having that trauma witnessed um, in a public way. Um, um, sorry, I've gone, go, go, got a bit lost. Oh, oh I know what I was going to say. Sorry. Um, I think the model of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commissions is an important model that talks about forgiveness and, and reconciliation. And I don't think that you need to forget or forgive in order to move forward. I, I, I've also kind of been focusing in on this kind of topic. And I heard um, Miroslav Wolf. Do you know him? I don't. I know his work very well. Sure. Yeah. So we were in that same space. I heard him speak um, on forgiveness, faith, and remembering. He's just done a book called Exclusion and Embrace, I think. And he was saying all oh, reconciliation is a process, a story about how we relate to others, and that reconciliation really requires that the person does repent and distance themselves from what they've done. Um, so... I think there does need to be sharing of stories and listening to the other, and we don't need to have forgetting in order to move forward towards understanding and reconciliation. Steve, I wonder what thoughts you have in response. Oh, can I say one other thing, actually? Of course. Of course. I, I, I've got this lovely quote from Bassam that, actually didn't make it into the film I've got they had so much rich material that I thought would be interesting to share about religion because he says uh, from a human point of view from a religious point of view I'm more important than Jerusalem than Mecca itself the holiest place this is what Islam teaches mm -hmm. and he also says there's no specific holy land we are the holy people we make it holy through our behavior so I just thought they were both really nice quotes that touch on issue of religion here thank you well, i'm pausing jeremy this sort of response because i'm i'm uh i'm hesitant to keep engaging on a on a tack of conversation that sort of implies sort of what what forms of repentance or what solutions look like to this this conflict but i i what i what i am thinking about as i listen to this though is um is again to reflect on um, the work that even gets us into this conversation. The um, I'm uh, I, I'm aware, you know, Boston Jewish Film Festival. Like here we are. I I feel like it's important to maybe back up a second and honor um, the local work of Boston Partners for Peace and the way into that and and the work of JCRC. And that um, I think what many people may not be aware of is that when uh, folks like myself, like Christian clergy are brought to meet the Boston Partners for Peace. Um, we are invited um, by you, Jeremy, and your partners in JCRC into an invitation to see the land of Israel or to see the land of Israel and Palestine from as many perspectives as possible. And I believe courageously for you as a Jewish civic organization to invite us to see from a variety of Jewish perspectives, but from non-Jewish perspectives from in, in this case Palestinian perspectives as well um I don't know that that's what most of us expect when we think about these kind of tours to 
the Holy Land. And I, I think that in a way, like the um, the work of JCRC and Partners for Peace is is doing something parallel to the work of the Parent Circle and to this film of engaging people in deep, in, in invitation to deep empathetic perspective taking um, with the hope that that will get us somewhere good together the more we do that. And I am, um, I, I believe in that mission profoundly, and I uh, a beneficiary of it in this case as well. Um, well, I, I very much appreciate you saying that. Like for me, I believe um, you cannot really know a place and, without truly engaging authentically with all the people of that place. And I think it's an invitation for us to really engage with all of the people and to see them as they want to be seen themselves. And that really connects with Rami and Bassam and all of these grieving family members about they're coming into a room and some of a part of what they want to do is just be seen in their own grief. And there is a, you know, there, there's a beautiful quote in the, in the film, I think from uh, Rami about, you know, once I've held your grief, you know, we can move forward. Uh, I'm totally mangling it because I watched the film a few days ago. But well, I think I it says something like once you listen to the pain of the other, you can expect the other to listen to your pain. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, probably watched that film a few more times than I have at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, I want to touch on something. You know, Steve, you mentioned uh, not wanting to dive into solutions. And Esther, you uh, brought up the example of South Africa. And I want to connect this and broaden it out just a little bit for a minute. I often think about the model of Northern Ireland and yes. the idea that in Northern Ireland, uh, the first minister would often, uh, a former first minister, uh, actually a few years ago was at um, a conference organized by Women Wage Peace um, and Women of the Sun, which are an Israeli and a Palestinian group that actually protest in front of the Knesset and in front of Palestinian government offices in support of leadership. And this former first minister of Northern Ireland said, if you had told me a week before the Good Friday Accords were signed that peace was possible, I would have told you you're crazy. And then all of a sudden it was here. And part of what he talks about is the idea that the conditions were created on the ground through pe uh, people to people initiatives that by the time the Good Friday Accords came out, something like 20% of all the people in Northern Ireland had, ex had participated in cross sector, people to people things, whether that was children's um, athletic groups or knitting circles or dialogue groups or parental loss groups as well. And part of that for me is like, we don't have to be out solutions. We have to look at the bottom up to actually seeing each other um, as people in this space that these two people share. And also that there are so many other groups. And Esther, you know, one of, I, I noticed that uh, one of the uh, sponsors or supporters you thank at the end is the Alliance for Middle East Peace. And so much work has moved forward in the last couple of years, and we've been very proud to be part of that, of working with them and others to advocate for what's called the Nita Lowy Fund, uh, which invests I was wondering in, if you were going to say Nita yeah. Lowy. So that's an amazing, the MEPA, the MEPA $250 million grant for peace. So I do want to say, Jeremy, that I don't know if you know what the background to that is, but they made a direct comparison with Northern Ireland. I, I can't remember the exact figures, but they were saying that maybe, you know, 50-something dollars per person was spent on people-to-people yeah. -people peacemaking in Northern Ireland compared to about six in Israel and Palestinian territories, and they realised that they needed to be more money put into that. Yeah. Yeah. And there are so many groups on the ground now who are doing it. It's not just uh, the Bereaved Parents Circle or one of the other groups uh, we've been to. And I, if there's, you know, there are no upsides to a pandemic, but it certainly opened up opportunities to experience things was, um, you know, the Hand-in-Hand -hand Schools or Yad Biyad, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, started in Jerusalem and is now in like six or eight cities, they do a similar program for their students uh, where they bring together, they, their classrooms are 50-50 uh, Jewish and Palestinian, which is, we won't get into it, like in the Israeli educational system, a fairly unique experience. And they do a joint Yom HaZikaron, Nakba Day experience. And during the pandemic, they were able to bring in over Zoom, uh, the parents witnessed it for the first time and some of us American supporters. And I feel like that is an interesting part of the work. And I wanna bring this back to Steve before we wrap up. You know, we're talking a lot about this particular conflict and Esther, you really looked at this in the through the lens of these people in this space where the conflict is ongoing and real and 
you know, even as we're recording this, continues to cause trauma. And there's a there's a there's a point that is made in the film and which these parents make all the time, which is that they're the only organization not looking for new members. Mm -hmm. And I know that between the time we film this and unfortunately the time that our audience sees this, there will probably be new eligible members. And I, I wonder what that means for each of you as well as what it means for your own work steve back here in boston i know i have my own feelings about this but your own work of seeing people in this most difficult of situation reaching out to each other's humanity yeah. and what that maybe inspires for us and our work back home yeah absolutely i mean when i um sit with a film or when i have the privilege thanks to you jeremy to sit with rami and basam in person in jerusalem I don't come first as a Christian or as a clergy of American. I come as a father in my case. And so I, I, I'm I, invited to, as a father of three children, to grieve uh, in solidarity with them, uh, imagining the loss of a child, right? What a, and, and I think, oh, if I can do that, I'm having a small version of the experience they've had with one another to say, if you can grieve the loss of another's child, like you, you can't... I, it'd be very difficult for you to relate to that person and to what that person stands for um, with the same degree of rigidity or enmity or hostility again. And so I, I agree that there's something maybe, you know, particular to this, to this work, but something universal as well. I mean, this came up in your, your bio, right. For around sort of LGBT inclusion and religious spaces. Like I've been very involved in Christian spaces and this work, and it's just well known that when people have um, experiences of personal loving connection with someone whose sort of sexual identity or orientation is is different than they've understood before, that for most people, that's a transformative experience, right? More transformative than their kind of ideological or religious beliefs at hand. And so I've seen that at work, like in work within my own faith to become more inclusive, right? The sort of power of perspective taking and of empathetic relationships. And, and I think it's, I mean, I, I, whatever, I'm, I'm opinionated here, but whatever, we'll go with our opinions, right? I just think like, good good religion and good citizenship should invite us to name and see the holy in not just ourselves or our kind but in the other and like if we can do more of that like we'll accomplish some really profound things in our world right and uh when we fail to do that a, a lot of um violent and ugly and horrible things happen so thanks so yeah. esther uh, we are coming to the end of our time so I'll, I'll make the last sort of framing to you uh, as you listen to us as two uh, people who experience your gift to the world, as you listen to us as two people who um, have an opportunity to sit with the power of these stories and the people telling these stories to each other into the world, what do you hope will be the impact of this film for those who've watched it tonight and for those who are going to be watching it in various festivals and in distribution in the coming months? Thank you, Jeremy. Um, well, I have to say that I actually feel very sad at the moment with what's happening in Israel. I really feel, you know, heartbroken. Um, uh, my film is a film of hope. Um, it shows what could be, you know. It shows what it was is being built. I, I did wonder when I was making it, does it end in too positive a note? But I want it... But but that work is being done and that, that is possible. But I feel the film in a way shows the watershed that Israel is facing and that Israel's standing on this kind of crossways, a parting of the way with roads that lead the country in different directions. And the Israeli and Palestinian bereaved individuals in the film and the organisation they're part of represent that ability to hear and understand the pain of the other, including, you know, LG. To LGBTQI, you know, all of that. Sorry, um, it's a it's a road that protects the rights of minority. It's a road that's moderate and nuanced about religion and culture, and realistic and able co to compromise about issues of land and state. But the other road, we see that other the other road of the opposition in the film, the Israeli protesters who were yelling outside, left wing bastards and filthy traitors, and and on the Palestinian side, the people who threaten those who speak and. Hamas who jails people who meet Israelis to talk peace but I'm scared where Israel is now and which direction it's going so I think we really need to bolster up that 
hopeful side in Israeli. It exists, it can change the culture, but it needs support from us all. So I guess, yeah, that's what that's what I hope the film can show people this is a way that exists there and it needs our support to make it happen. Well, that's a very hopeful note to end on. And I agree with you entirely, especially at times when the headlines uh, can cause so much despair to remain focused on the people who are engaging directly with each other and creating hope uh, through that engagement and creating possibility is an excellent place uh, to end on. And I hope that uh, people will share this film widely, tell their friends about uh, the Bereave Families Forum. And uh, for those of you here in Boston, uh, to learn more about Boston Partners for Peace and the literally dozens of organizations that we are connected to that are doing this kind of work all across the Israeli and Palestinian sectors. And it's really just a privilege to meet you, Esther, and to engage and talk with you. And Steve, you're a wonderful partner and colleague in this work. And I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, Jeremy, Esther, and Steve, this was such a profound and deeply moving spiritual and heartfelt conversation. I hate for it to end. Um, I think we can't hear stories enough like those of Rami Bassam, Bushra, and Maital. Uh, in the narrow bridge enough. I love what you said about the importance of possibility and hope. Um, as Esther knows, I've been in the space with a film I made for many, many, many years. And everything you all I said about- last night. Huh? Oh, you did? <laughs> What's your film last night? Thank you. Um, it's called My So-Called Enemy. And um, having been in that space, I concur with you a thousand percent, all three of you, that with conflict resolution, the first people thing people want is for their voices to be heard, for their stories to be heard, um, and for their suffering to be acknowledged, and not to feel that their histories have been erased. And I'm also all about possibility and hope. I think we need it now more than ever in this dark time, partly dark time. And the three of you are hope too. So I just can't thank you enough for this time and your love and heart. Full bios of all three of you, our esteemed guests. Um, Esther, sorry, I left out your books, um, are on our website. The Boston Israeli Film Festival website is bostonisraelifilm.org. Um, and you can also find that on our regular website, bostonjfilm.org. So please, to those tuning in, stay in touch, learn about our year-round programs, um, sign up for our newsletter, and just thank you all for for being part of the conversation and for listening in. Hope to see you all soon. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Conversation. Thanks, Lisa. Good to be with you all.